Week 18. You know why we call it Week 18? Because it's the 18th week that we have been trying to read through the Bible in a year, starting in January. That's why. So if you're keeping up, we're at week 18. This is Spiritual Rants, by the way. This is Jerry Rothhauser. And week 18 means April 30th through May 6th, Judges 11 through Ruth. John 1. We get all the way to John in the Gospels through chapter 4, verse 54, Psalm 101 to 105, and Proverbs 14, 13 through 27. Now, what we try to do in the shortened version of spiritual rants every week is touch on an important topic. Now, if you listen to last year's, which I post up again every week this year, you'll hear the highlights of just about everything in that week's reading. But we've been talking about spirituality. What's it mean? What's the Bible say about it? What is incumbent? On us, that's a good word, isn't it? Incumbent. <laughs> In other words, what do we have to do? And we talked about some of the history of spirituality in the past couple hundred years. And basically, the last century comes out a lot better, or actually the 1800s, the century before the last one. The 1800s and the 1700s come out a lot better, I think, than what we're experiencing now, which is not much. <laughs> We have the large churches and not a lot of teaching going on, and they certainly are missing out on the things that we talked about the past few weeks, and we talked about. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. We talked about the four commands regarding the Holy Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit, which aren't normally mentioned in churches today. In fact, here's, here's something else revival. You ever heard of a revival? Years ago, Churches used to have a revival. And now, I, you know, I, I don't hear, I, I asked my wife and she said, no, the church around the corner, the little one, had a revival recently. But other than that, no, I don't hear about it. What's a revival for? It's to be revived, <laughs> of course. And it means. It's exciting, exhorting people to getting closer to the Lord. And of course, they would be more excited after that happening. And there are spiritual songs and good preaching and exhortation, encouragement. We don't have that so much anymore. Why? Well, we don't have an emphasis really on the Holy Spirit except in excess. And that goes back, we talked about that a little bit last time, the Azusa Street Revival. And it was a revival. But what happened was before that, that was like 1906 to 1915 on a street called Azusa Street in Los Angeles. But that experience was built on. The previous hundred years, where there were revivals and there was talk about the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And as we pointed out a little bit in last week's and I think the week before that too in the podcast, that it's based on basically. A faulty doctrine 
that comes out of the book of Acts. Now, despite it being a faulty doctrine, it was a little bit off, but I think that people thinking more about the Holy Spirit, reading about the Holy Spirit in the Bible, that that gets them closer to God. And so it works. So in the 1800s, 1700s also, they talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a second work of grace. Now, I think that's a little bit off, but at least they were talking about the Holy Spirit. So they were getting close enough. There were guys named Tory, R.A. Tory, uh, Dwight Moody, George Whitfield, Billy Sunday. All of those guys emphasized the Holy Spirit. In fact, there used to be conferences back in those days that talked about holiness. Well, you don't hear about that much today, do you? Here's the other side of that coin, sin. And when you go to a revival, usually there is some talk about sin. Is think about your life. Are you sinning? You know, what kind of sin? How can you clear it up? Right? Those kinds of things get you closer to God. Now, those fellows I mentioned, Tory, Moody, Whitfield, Sunday, believed in a second work of grace called the baptism in the Spirit, and that erupted at the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles in early 1900s, where then they got into excess. They got into too much on tongue speaking and gifts and all of that, and they got excited about the Lord, which was a good thing. And as I pointed out, I think it was last week, that churches out of that tradition, even to this day, do more evangelism in my estimation, than any other kinds of churches. They go out and tell people about the Lord. So that's because the power of the Holy Spirit is associated with them and their lives. So where it comes from, and I'm just going to do this briefly for your, for you theological heads, you know, like... Um, there's people into cars and they're gearheads, right? <laughs> or uh, tech tech geeks. But if you're a spiritual Bible geek, then you may want to know this. You go through the book of Acts and it looks like, it looks like, and I call that the law of first thought, <laughs> which is usually wrong. You know, you read something in the Bible and you think, oh, it must be such and such. And then you study it a little bit more and you find out, uh, no, I guess not. And this is one of those. Acts 8 and 9, the gospel went to the Samaritans. Well, first to the apostles and disciples. Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. And in John 20, 22, Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit, and he breathed on them. So it looked like they had a second work in Acts 2. And Acts 8, the gospel went to the Samaritans, and it looked like they knew something about Jesus, and then afterward received the Holy Spirit. It looked like a second work. Paul had an encounter with Jesus, and then someone came to him and put their hands on him, and his blindness disappeared, looked like a second work. The Gentiles, the gospel went to the Gentiles then. In Acts 10, looks like they had a second work of grace. And the disciples of John, finally, in Acts 19, looked like they had some knowledge about maybe Jesus or baptism, 
but not about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So it looks that way, but really, if you put it in context, the book of Acts is an historical accounting. So that was written for us to know how the church began. But that doesn't mean we should do what they did. It's not prescriptive. In other words, it's not commanding us to do something. It's descriptive. It tells us what actually did happen. Now, we look at like 1 Corinthians 12, 13, one by one spirit, we're baptized into one body. That's probably more akin to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That when we're saved, the Holy Spirit indwells in us, like Romans 8 tells us, and if we don't belong to Christ, we don't have the Holy Spirit. So either you're saved and have the Holy Spirit, or you're not saved and you don't have the Holy Spirit. An evangelist who was a fundamentalist head (laughs) from probably almost 100 years ago, John R. Rice, wrote a paper called The Sword of the Lord. Isn't that a great name? Anyway, I don't hold to all of his lifestyle and all the things he said, but he did say this. I believe that the experience and testimony of the mighty men of God, whose words we have given in this chapter that he had written, are overwhelming in their unity. Let no one think that the doctrine of this book that he had written is new or strange. Essentially, it is the same teaching as of Moody, Torrey, Chapman, Sunday, Finney, and others I hadn't even heard of. So those who have gone away from the doctrine of the fullness of the Spirit, the power of Pentecost, as a special endowment, yeah, that's a real word, (laughs) of power for soul winning, possible for every Christian to be sought with prevailing prayer. In other words, you should ask for this experience in the Holy Spirit. And he says that they have, the church has had a departure from the position of the great soul winners. This falling away in doctrine came with the falling away from revival. Men do not believe in the power of Pentecost simply because they do do not themselves have the power of Pentecost. Now, I want to tell you, you don't have to seek very hard for the Holy Spirit because you already have it. Now, maybe you haven't experienced the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a problem. I was talking to someone this past week, and, and they said that the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to connect with God. Boy, that's good. Connect with God. You don't have to just have the power of the Holy Spirit to evangelize and be an evangelist, but you need that in preaching. You need that in mothering, fathering, in real estate, in DJing, whatever you do. You need the Holy Spirit. And that will result in in a revival. The fella that married me and my wife has passed on like quite a while, probably almost 10 years ago maybe, went on to to be with the Lord. He always talked about revival, revival, revival. He tried to get churches to get involved in revival. They, they didn't. So when he was put away, I made a promise to him. I'm going to try to excite people to revival. And I thought, I don't even know what that means. (laughs) And I really didn't do it because I didn't know, you know, what that meant or what, what any church or person should do. But I just told you about it. Now, one thing 
we don't want to leave out is 1 John 1, 9, the confession of sins. We don't talk about holiness. We don't talk about sin, but we should. And so, if you're having a tough time in your Christian life, one thing you should do first is take a litany of your sin and review and make sure you're right with the Lord in every aspect. Now, we'll probably be talking about that again next week. Something called the dark night of the soul. We'll talk about that next time. I hope you'll be downloading. Tell your friends. This is Jerry Rothhauser with Spiritual Rants.